I want to welcome you here. Those online, we're so glad that you're watching with us as well. Uh, we launched into a brand new teaching series last week, and, and here was the goal. Uh, I talked about the goal is not this, as we're starting a new year, to talk about self-care and like how to get in shape and that kind of thing, but to talk about soul care and to talk for a bit about what, what's going on in our souls and, and to, to qualify what that is. Like my goal is not that you can leave from here and give a dictionary definition of what the soul is after a 35 minute talk or today after 70 minutes. If you've been here two years, two weeks in a row, not that you can hear somebody say, what's the soul? And say, well, let me tell you what the soul is. The soul is, but to raise an awareness of what God is up to in our lives and in our world, to raise a sensitivity to say, God, we want you to work in our lives. And so I use this graph, we'll put it up here. This is from Dallas Willard, uh, his book, Renovation of the Heart. And uh, this is just for me has been so helpful to talk about. There's these different aspects of who we are as people. There's the spirit, other people refer to that as maybe the will, the heart of your life, like who you are, the uh, mind, the thoughts, the emotions of our lives. There's the body, those physical aspects of us. Social, there's those relationships. We have a relationship with God we've been created for and others. And then there's the soul. And Dallas Willard talks about the soul being the integrating factor that takes all of these parts of who we are and it makes us one. So in places in scripture, the soul is sometimes just I, me, the, the totality of who I am as a person, and there are inputs, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, uh, informing us and guiding us, and then there are outputs, uh, expressing faith in Christ, and restoration in relationships, and, and communion, and God is wanting to work, I believe, in our lives to bring us together as a whole because of who He is as a gracious, loving father, as a shepherd of our souls to help us navigate this world. And so we're going to talk about that today. And, and in this like weekend where tomorrow there's a day of remembrance of Dr. Martin Luther King, to, to pause and I was looking at some of his words and uh, just remembering he had this concept that talks and reminds us of something is so vital today. The conversation is not about our strength, our force, our ability. Uh, Dr. King talked about a soul force. That when we're connected with God, we have an access to power that God and God alone can empower us. A soul force that's so strong in our lives because of Christ. That we can face anything. We can, we can be who he created us to be. And we can do what he's created us to do. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 16 is where I'm going to begin for a while. And then I'm going to get to 1 Peter. And we're going to trace uh, some of Jesus' teaching through the Apostle Peter who struggled to grasp what Jesus was saying at first. And then it was like a light dawned on him and he was able to then follow Jesus. And so Woody started us out today talking about being mindful. And I'm going to pick that up and talk about like what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? You know those sayings like you're all in your head? Like, like if we could see what was going on inside your mind, inside of your heart, like what would we see? Like when I was growing up we had these cartoons or these images and it was like this. A thought cloud, and some of you are like, that's sort of what's going on in me today. There's just, it's blank, not a lot there. A little bit blank today. Like, what is it that's going on? But for others of us, if we were, if we were truthful, we would, we would say something like, you know what's going on in, in my life is a lot of this. I won't, I won't, I won't. I'm living from desire. What do I want? For, for others of, it, of us, we would say, if I'm being honest, it's a little bit more like this. It's I deserve. It's not just I won't, it's I, I deserve. I, this is not fair that other people get good and I, stuff and I don't. Like, I deserve more than this. So what's going on? Others of us are at a place where we're living and it's a little bit like this. Why, why God? We don't understand a circumstance. We don't understand a situation. And, and maybe God is just asking us, inviting us to trust him and to live in a different way. So let me pick up in Matthew chapter 16 with what uh, Jesus is trying to help his disciples understand that eventually then Peter, as a mature person later in life, writes to help us understand. So Matthew 16, I'll start reading in verse 21. The 
Scriptures say, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples. He's helping them to understand. To explain to his disciples, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus knows this is going to happen. He tries to explain to his disciples so that they can understand and they can prepare themselves. Look what happens, verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. Can you imagine the audacity of Peter saying, I know you're Lord and I know you're all that, but like Jesus, you're wrong. Never, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, or Satan. That's what he says, you are a stumbling block to me. You're a stumbling block to me, to my message, to my purposes. Like you don't, you're, you're, you're stumbling, you're, you're tripping over what is going on. You're a stumbling block because you do not have in mind the concerns of God. In your mind, you don't have the concerns of God. You're thinking human stuff. You only have human concerns in your mind. Verse 24, then Jesus said to the disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is Jesus saying, if you want to, if you want to be my disciple, and I'm assuming that a lot of you, since you're at church today, you're like, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. Here's what he says. You must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Listen to this. For whoever wants to save their life, but that word life is the same Greek word soul. Whoever wants to save their soul must lose it, will lose it. But whoever loses their life, same Greek word for soul, whoever loses their life for me will find it. He says if we're the kind of people who want to save our lives by our own effort, by our own like merit and, and good deeds, if we're trying to be our own savior, We'll lose our soul. But on the other hand, if we lose our life, meaning surrender and sacrifice to who Jesus is, we will find it. Look what he asks in verse 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole entire world, yet forfeit or lose their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So, so like I said, Jesus is trying to invite us into a conversation you're probably not having in anywhere else in this world. You're probably not going to like school necessarily or work necessarily or wherever you hang out necessarily and having a soul conversation. But Jesus says, what, what would it profit if you gained the whole entire world? If you were the smartest, the best looking, the most in shape, the richest, the most popular, and you lose your soul. What would, it, what, would it, what would it profit? What would the gain ultimately be in that? And so Jesus wants to have with his disciples and Peter, the one that just said, no, 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 God. He wants to have a soul level conversation and he wants to put things into perspective. Last verse I want to read in this passage, verse 27, for the son of man, this is Jesus talking still, for the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels. Then he will reward each person according to what they have done. It is staggering how often Jesus wants to talk about eternity. How often Jesus wants to talk about not just our life in this world, which that really matters, but also our eternal life after we die. Jesus wants to talk about, and that is what we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about. And so I've got four important reminders for our souls, and the first one is this. According to this passage, Jesus wants us to remember our souls are eternal. Our souls are eternal. It is very important to try to make the most of your life on this earth. It is very important for you to have priorities and not to waste your days or waste your life, but our souls are eternal. We must remember that. We don't want to waste our souls. 
Like, like there's some days, I don't know if you ever have this experience where I like a day off or something like that and I get through a day and I'm like, that was just restful. That was just relaxing. I needed a day to rest and relax. Like, aren't you grateful for those days? For some of you, it's Sunday and you're at church. Praise God. For me, this is a little bit of a work day. I have to find other times. Sometimes I have a day off. Maybe you've had this experience and I get to the end of the day and I'm like, you know, that wasn't just like a restful day. I think I just wasted, I squandered that day. Do you know what I mean? You're like, I squandered that. I probably watched a few too many episodes of Formula One on Netflix. (laughs) Maybe I should have done something a little more productive. And it's possible to waste my life or waste my soul the way sometimes I can waste a day if I live too long with no priorities or focus. And Jesus is warning us, To to remember, our souls are eternal. We were created by God with worth and dignity. This is the worth of every soul. This is never, you don't read in scripture this idea of your soul is so unworthy. Here's what you read, your soul could be lost. But it's worthy, worthy enough for Jesus to die on a cross for our sins so we can have life. So first of all, our souls are eternal. And Jesus is helping Peter learn this, put it into practice and experience. And then guess what? Peter writes later in scripture uh, a letter, a couple of them, to help us understand what Jesus helped him understand. So if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and, and we'll see Peter eventually learned these lessons. Peter learned to stop rebuking Jesus. I hope we'll learn that lesson today. Not a good idea, idea to put Jesus in his place. And Peter finally learns these lessons about the soul. And so what exactly did Peter learn about the soul? Well, I'm glad you asked. First Peter chapter one, um, verse eight is where I'll start. Here's what Peter writes. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Talking about Jesus and Peter's a guy that had seen him. So he's writing even to us to say, you've not seen him, but you love him. And even though, talking about Jesus, even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. If you're a Christian, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You're filled with a joy. Look what he says. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The end result of our faith is not that we just get what we've been praying for. The end result of our faith is not that circumstances in this life turn out the way we asked and wished they would. The end result of our faith is the salvation of our souls. We will die, FYI, stats are in, it's 100%. We will die, 100% of us will die, and then we go to eternity. If we are in Jesus, we go to eternity, and we then experience real life, the salvation of our souls. So here's that second important reminder. Peter wants to pass on because Jesus helped him understand our souls need to be saved. And we can't save ourselves. The truth of scripture is our souls need to be saved And no matter who you are, no matter how good you are, we can't save ourselves. We need a savior, and that's why Jesus came. I love that in Strength to Love, the way that Dr. King put it when he wrote, Christianity affirms that at the heart of reality is a heart of a loving father, our God, who works through history for the salvation of his children. People can't see, people cannot save themselves, for we, we're not the measure of all things. And humanity is not God. We are bound by chains of our own sin and our finiteness. We need a savior. We need a savior. And the starting point of a a conversation about a soul is to realize this. Our souls need to be saved. And Jesus came so we could have a savior. Peter continues. First, uh, Peter, here's chapter 2, verse 11. Peter writes these words, dear friends. So put it in context, just a reminder. Peter is writing to Christians, people who say, I'm following Jesus. He calls them dear friends. I urge you as foreigners and exiles. So that context just means like you're living in a land that doesn't feel like home. You're living in a place where the values don't align. Does anybody feel like you're like a stranger in your own homeland? Because you're trying to follow Jesus and the values don't align. That's what he's talking about. Look what he says. I I urge you to abstain from sinful desires 
which war against your soul. To abstain from sinful desires, it means to resist. It means that, that there are things we have to fight against, we have to say no to. Important reminder for our souls, number three is this. There is a war for our souls going on. You probably didn't wake up this morning and raise your head and sit up on the side of the bed and like, today is a war for my soul. So I'm here to remind you, today there is a war for your souls. I had this image as I was praying for all of us this morning. I had an image of sometimes we become Christians and some of us think when we become Christians it's like we're getting onto a ship. And some of us think when we become Christians we're getting onto a ship and it's a carnival cruise line to the Bahamas. And we're so excited about our cruise and getting on the water slide and going wee all the way down and going for an excursion because we think following Jesus is like going on a cruise to the Bahamas and it's just going to be fun and easy and great and glorious. When in reality, when we decide to follow Jesus, it's like we walk onto a ship only to realize it's a Navy battleship going to war. And there's a war for our souls. And becoming a Christian doesn't fix everything. It just equips us and empowers us in the strength that God has to face whatever comes our way in life. So Peter warns us, there's a, there's a war for our souls. He says, so you, you're gonna have to abstain from some things. You're gonna have to fight and be an active battle. There, there's a battle on different fronts. You, you live in a world that is filled with temptations, that is filled with a brokenness and a, and a fallenness. You, you have a flesh, the, the body that unredeemed has temptations and there's different uh, propensities we have to sin and you have a devil and his demons who are after us. There's spiritual warfare. We've gotta be ready to fight because there's a war against your souls. And so Peter says, abstain from those sinful desires, those lusts that want to destroy you, the greed that wants to get you. Now, maybe at this point in a sermon, you're thinking, hey, it's still sort of like the new year. Couldn't we have a new year sermon that's happy? <laughs> Couldn't we have a new year sermon, victory, blessings, prosperity, miracles, healings, yes. And you'd be like, sign me up for that. And if I'm not careful, I could be signing you up and setting you up for disappointment at what you actually face this year. And, and here's, you, you have a choice like to say, do I wanna listen to what God says? I, I just wanna say, I don't know that I have a choice today. I feel like I have to say what God wants to be said. You can listen if you want to or not. I have to say with all the hope and grace and love that God can give me what God wants to be said. Because these are things we don't talk about hardly ever or anywhere else in the world. So. At church, we probably need to address them. And so in the Bible, there's this word that sometimes we avoid in this world called sin. There's a biblical word for sin. Now, in English, we really, I mean, honestly, we almost always just use the word sin, if you've been around church long at all, to mean all of these kinds of things. But the Bible has different words in the Greek New Testament for sin. For examples, look at this slide real quick. Uh, one example, uh, sometimes the word sin um, in the Bible is this Greek word that is translated disobedience. But literally the word translated disobedience, here's what it means. To not listen, to not hear or heed God's word. So what, what that is helping us understand is disobedience is, is like a little kid saying this. I don't want to hear any of that. That word doesn't even necessarily imply that you did something wrong. It, it implies you refuse to even hear. You're like, I don't want to know what it says. There's another word used for sin, violation. It's like to step over a line. Like, like maybe there's a line and, and you're like, I know probably I shouldn't go to or past that line. And, it, and it's to disregard that line and to step over. There's another word for sin that it could be translated wickedness. It's to transgress or iniquity in some translations. It, it means to do wrong. But that's usually what we mean when we hear the word like sin, to do wrong. But, but the fourth word is the word that is used most often in Scripture 
In the Greek, it's this hemartia. I don't know if that's, that's the right way to pronounce it, but it's an archery term to talk about an archer who is aiming at the center of the target. And the literal translation of that word sin is to miss the mark. It's to miss the, the target. It, it doesn't even necessarily mean doing something wrong. It may mean not doing the right things you've been asked to do. And so this is complicated. There, there's no like simple, like here's what this means. This is a complex thing. And if we are in a place where our souls need to be saved and there's a war for our souls, we, we've got to understand the battle. And not all of our battles are the same. And the, the, the devil, the world, is filled with all kinds of specific temptations custom made for you and I. And so there are lists in the Bible. There's a number of lists at different places of these are kinds of sins. These are groupings. Or, now, not one list is exhaustive. The goal is not to write down every sin that could be. But let me show you a few ex examples. There's one in 1 Peter where we're at. Chapter 2, verse 1. Look at this list. This is 1 Peter. There's five things there. Malice. Um, there's deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Malice is wishing bad or injury on someone. Deceit is to, to, to deceive, to lie. Envy is, is, is jealousy. And like I read that and I'm like, oh, I have a heart prone to jealousy. I'm not like oblivious to this. This, this hits home. Slander is to say something bad about somebody behind their back. Hypocrisy is to try to play a part, to try to look like you're better than you are or something that you're not is to, to play this part. So, so Peter gets specific and says, these are the kinds, these are examples of some of the things that war against our soul. There's, there's other places where it gets like longer list and even more profound and one that a lot of churches go to automatically, which it's a, it's a pretty strong list, is in Romans 1. And in Romans 1, if you read what's going on, Paul is giving strict warnings Paul is saying, you got to watch out for what's going on. We weren't supposed to put the slide up that fast. <laughs> Take the slide down. You're cheating. You're not supposed to be cheating. In Romans 1, the list is like set up by this concept. What are we thinking? Because this is the kind of thing that Paul says. Uh, watch out for those who suppress truth by their wickedness. Watch out for those who claim to be wise, but they become fools. Watch out. The, 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 the big like, listing that, that makes this a controversial passage is that it begins to refer to sexual desires. And the scripture talks about this word like sexual immorality in a lot of places. The, the literal root Greek word is this word porneia, which we specifically get our word pornography, sexual immorality. What, what we see here in, in Romans, in the writings of Paul, what we see in the, the teachings of Jesus is when you find this category that's called sexual immorality, it's, it's really anything that's in the context of a relationship between two people who are not married, male and female, husband and wife together. It, it becomes what the Bible calls sexual immorality. And it covers a whole host of things. And, and then you get specifically to Romans chapter one and it calls out and tries to give this clarity to what does the Bible teach on homosexuality? And the Bible teaches that it fits the category of sexual immorality because it's not a married relationship between a husband and a wife. But don't stop there. Keep reading the rest of the scripture. And also now we can put the list up there. And sexual immorality is there. It's absolutely there, but guess what else is there? Envy and greed, murder and strife and deceit and malice, gossips. And I have to look at my own heart and my own life against a list like this and to say, oh man, my soul needs a savior. There's a war that's raging against my soul. And I can't save myself. Slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, arrogant. Oh, not that one. Like, isn't a little bit of arrogance a good thing because it makes you confident? Boastful. 
disobedient to parents? <laughs> And we like scratch our heads. We're like, okay, wait a minute. Like some of these I see, like these are evening news kinds of things like murderers. I want a mugshot of the murderer up there. But can you imagine evening news? This person was disobedient to their parents. Here's their mugshot. You're, you're like, wait a minute. You're like, I get the smash and grab person like that. That's on the evening news. But like, it is, and this is Paul helping us understand there's a seriousness to our sin. There's a war raging against our souls. And the enemy's not playing games. There's another list you could find in 2 Timothy chapter three. I'm not gonna go through it, but look at that. There's another list that you can find in Mark chapter seven. This is from Jesus, look at that. And my, my, my goal here is not to give you the exhaustive list, and if you wanna get them, you can always watch on YouTube tomorrow and, and take pictures then. My goal is to say, there's all kinds of ways that our souls are being warred against and we've gotta be ready for the battle however it comes. And our souls need a savior. We can't save ourselves. It's God's grace and grace alone that helps us to experience salvation and to be restored when we turn. First Peter, we're, we're still there, and so First Peter chapter two, verse 25, Peter continues to write, and wanting to help us understand so desperately what this is about. Verse 25, Peter writes, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So Peter is saying, we can go astray. And it even seems like he's writing to Christians. That's what 1 Peter is primarily about. And this is to those of us who maybe there was a moment where we, we became a Christian, we're following Jesus, but along the way we went astray, meaning we were deceived or we were in error or we wandered. And he says, here's the fourth important reminder of our souls. Number four is our souls need a shepherd. And isn't that good news that we can return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls? No matter what we've done, no matter how we've wandered, no matter how long we've been gone, we can return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Our souls need a shepherd. And I get it. This is, this is a heavy talk. There, there's a lot of weightiness to it, but there's also a lot of freedom to it if we discover the life that is for us in Christ and what God wants to do in our life. So here's the question. What do we do now? How do we respond in moments like this? So I wanna give you a, a couple of ideas. First of all, 1 John chapter 1, verse eight. This is what John the apostle writes to help us know what we do in a moment like this. John writes, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Whatever of those four categories, disobedience, like we're not listening to the word of God, wickedness or stepping over a line or sin like missing the mark, if we claim to be without sin, I don't have any sin in our, my life. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Look at the counter. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, confess, the word confess literally means to agree. So it's literally not me writing something in here. It's God, whatever you're writing in here, I agree with you. That's what confess means. It means literally to say the same thing, to agree with, like mentally to give assent, God, you're right, and to confess our sins is also to say, I'm sorry. And if we do that, look first to, to, to who God is. He's faithful and he's just. So, so listen to what this means. This doesn't mean God excuses our sin. It doesn't mean God is an avoider. I don't want anything to do with your sin. It means he's just. And here's what it means. God's already provided payment for our sin, and it doesn't come to us. It came to Jesus on a cross. So we can be free and forgiven because of what Christ has done for us on a cross. He's just, and he's faithful, and he will forgive, and he will purify if we confess so, here's what we do. We confess our sins, first of all, for salvation. That's how we're saved. We turn to Jesus for salvation. We repent. That's, that's another idea of saying, how do we confess? And we believe, we trust him. There's a turning. 
And also, that's the same way we live our lives. We confess our sins for salvation, but also for flourishing life in Christ. I don't know if you know this, um, but you can be a Christian and still sin. You can be a Christian and still be prideful, arrogant, all those lists, you can still do those things. But here's what happens if you're a Christian, there's something called conviction, and you turn back and say to God, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and there's a fresh start. And you know what you also do? You confess to others, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? That's why James writes, confess your sins to one another so that you can be healed. And you're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm okay confessing to God, but this whole confess to each other, that sounds like a whole other level of authenticity. Oh, it does, doesn't it? I know there's different religious backgrounds here, and so to confess your sins to God, here's what we believe. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our advocate. We don't have to go to another person to confess our sins. We have direct access to God our Father through Jesus Christ, and so we go to him for, with our confession for, for forgiveness, and then we also go to others for a right relationship. And so, in moments where we are living by our desires and our wants, and we realize those are out of control. There's a turning point moment to saying, I'm not just going to live for myself. I'm sorry. That's what confession is. It's a moment of saying, I'm sorry. God, would you forgive me? Or to someone else, will you please forgive me? When we're living in that place that's like, I deserve this, it's about me. I'm the center of the story, and I'm not grateful or thankful for what God has done. It's this turning point of saying, thank you for what you've done, for your grace, God, for Jesus. Thank you. When we're living in those moments of, why, God? Just FYI, I read this this week, and it so resonated with me. You know, when we don't ask this question, Nobody asks this question when things are going really well. God, things are going so good for me. Why, God, are you so good? Shouldn't we ask it in times of prosperity as well as heartache? Well, we just ask it in times of heartache. And so we, instead of saying, why, God, we say, I trust you. No matter what, I'll trust you. That's a, that's a shift in our mind and our thinking and our soul to say, I will trust you no matter what. What? Because you're a faithful God. You've made a way for us. And so we confess for salvation. We confess for flourishing. Secondly, how do we respond? We've got to cultivate new habits. The, the reason that we called this series Start Over Again, the reason we said it's not a self-care series, but a soul care is, I, I don't, like, there's nothing wrong. Believe me, there's nothing wrong with saying, I want to get in better shape this year. That's great. It's just not enough. And so getting in really, really good shape physically doesn't necessarily mean anything for your soul if you don't add some things to it. So what are some soul practices? And two times in the last couple of weeks, I had this idea come, uh, an, an email somebody sent uh, here at the church, which was so helpful, a podcast I was listening to, and I thought this was so helpful. Cultivate new habits. Here's two categories of habits. Disciplines of engagement and disciplines of abstinence. Some of us need to renew some commitments to Bible reading, to prayer, to worship by showing up, service, and generosity. Those are act, uh, uh, disciplines of activity, of engagement. But there's also biblically disciplines of abstinence. We don't usually pay attention to those. Solitude, silence, fasting. Disciplines of absence aren't me saying a lot of things to God. They're me listening to God. We need both. But sometimes we're so activity oriented that sometimes we just need to slow down and wait and listen and let God speak and receive his word. God, what do you want to say to me? God, what do I need to hear? God, will you meet me in this moment? And God, I will trust you no matter what you say. Listen, I know this isn't easy 
But, but it's vital. It's vital for us to experience the life that, that Christ has for us. It's vital for us to align our ways to the, the words of Scripture. These words have been tested throughout the history. These words have been tested throughout the world. All kinds of people in all kinds of places have said, I'm going to look to you, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, and to your word to find the word. And I'm going to align my life to your word, not say I'm going to make this fit and choose my desires and preferences. That would have been a great place for an amen. Like one at least, but that's okay. And so we have a choice. A decision to make. Will we live our own way? Will we live for ourselves? Or will we say, no, God, I'm going to trust you in every way. And even, you know, he doesn't need permission, but even, God, I give you permission. Search my heart and show me the areas where there's a war against my soul and I'm not even paying attention. I think I'm on a cruise and I haven't even realized it's a battleship. And then not to fight in my own strength, but in the power and the grace of what God has already done for us in Christ. To not be divisive people who point to everybody else's sin, but never acknowledge and take responsibility for their own. Anybody know what I mean? Yep. And to say we want to be the kind of people in the kind of place that is holy and pure before God because his amazing grace is better than anything we've ever deserved. Would you pray with me? These can be heavy words and heavy ideas from Scripture, God. Would your Holy Spirit illuminate them and also fill us with your peace and your hope to receive them? There may be changes that are needed in our lives. There may be habits that need to go away and new habits that need to come. But what we're not wanting to do is to take matters into our own hands. We're wanting you to do in our life, God, what only you can do. So I pray there to be a moment of surrender in all of us to just simply say, God, have your way. That, that in the fullness of who we are as a human, our spirit, our soul, our mind, our emotions, our relationships, our body, and all of it, we want to be wholly devoted to you, wholeheartedly following and in love with you. And so there's some here today that today is a day of salvation, and I pray that they would turn to you in salvation. I pray that they would call out to you, God, please forgive me. God, I believe in you. And they would experience salvation as only you can. And then others that are here today that they would say, there's been a moment of salvation in my life, but the truth is I've been wandering astray. And today could be a day of returning to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. So God, would you lead us back to you? Guide us back to your grace. We thank you for your love. We praise you for your amazing grace in our lives. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.